Elvis Bruce Jr. Eyes are. I mean, the senior deputy district attorney uh, in Lynn County, California. A little taller now. In Marin County, California. Uh, I went to the retirement uh, unit recently and asked them to assess how long I've been in Marin County. And I was thinking I had two more years before I could retire. And the lady said, are you sitting or are you standing? I said, well, I'm sitting. Well, you tell us some good news, I'll stand for you. <laughs> and she said, in August of this year, your total service to Marin County will be 30 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a testament, testament or testimony to my mother. Uh, and I'll tell you why I reference my mother in a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm honored that I only served in the, as a lawyer in one county. And I have a rare experience as a young African American. I'm still rather young, I feel. As an African American male in this county, in the Bay County, in that county, the Bay Area, the state, the country, and the world, <coughs> to go in with a vision, with a mission, with passion, commitment, understanding my roots understanding what my mother taught me and pursuing my dreams, pursuing my goals. And I know that it's rare that people go in and say, I'm going to become a prosecutor. I'm going to get inside the wells of justice. I'm going to influence justice from the inside out. I'm going to be an agent of change. And I'm going to serve as a prosecutor with a conscience. And I've been doing that for 30 years. Almost 30 years. I'd like to thank uh, Vita, uh, Ms. Vita Flores, the communications director, for reaching out to me uh, last week and say, could you come and be on our panel as a male, as an African American male, as a, as a long term prosecutor in a rich white community? who is very active in the Bay Area, in the state, and the country, actually, and tell the legal women voters of the Bay Area why you chose that job, why you chose Wayne County, and why you are still a prosecutor. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate you all on 100 years of service and leadership after many, many years of struggle. In the struggle, there was leaders. And the leaders in the service from women made, I feel personally, this country what it is today. Uh, it's important also to understand we're in the leap year, and I feel we're still celebrating Black History Month. <laughs> so let us not forget the African American women who had that excellent <laughs> Women have struggled in this country for many years, but African American women and women of color, Latino women, and all women of color have struggled, 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 and are still struggling for their rights. And uh, the legal women voters are very important to make sure that there's some corrective action taken on those measures and those issues. So uh, Vita asked me to speak about uh, justice and social justice, and the prosecutor's role, the important role of the prosecutor in this whole time of interest and concern and movement and passion and action about social justice. What is the role of the prosecutor? And why is it important that prosecuting attorneys, city attorneys, district attorneys, UN, uh, California attorney generals, uh, federal prosecutors, why is it important that they be the main ones at the table of discussions. Not necessarily the defense attorneys, not necessarily the activists. I think, and from my research and from my experience, Sister, Sister Sanchez, uh, from my experience, for many, many years, I see the importance of me standing here speaking to you. Before I get there, let me share with you some important uh, statistics, and I won't bore you with statistics. But if you need to understand California, the lawyer pool, of 100% lawyers in the state right now, 
majority of lawyers are all white males. Still. 13% uh, of lawyers in the state of California are Asian. 7% of lawyers in the whole state of California are Latinos. African American men and women together only comprise 4% of all lawyers in this whole state. Uh, I say 70% of the uh, uh, lawyers in this country, a little over 70, around 70% 70 are white male adults, and about 42%, if you put all the women together, uh, about are women. So that's, those are scary statistics. In a country, uh, in a state where you see a lot of diversity, you see a lot of diverse families in different major metropolitan areas. You see the calls and conscious and political platforms and the campaign platforms by diversity and inclusion and uh, 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 equity and equality. But where is the representation? Where are the legislators, where are the lawyers who can carry the fight? in the court system, the fight for the community, that can educate and train, uh, as the sister said, Danielle said, they can educate and train and, and show that passion from the mic, which I'm sharing with you right now. I hope you can feel my passion. Yeah, and share that passion with the community. And not be afraid to get out and, and get those experiences. How can I represent a white family? How can I represent a white child, how can I represent an African-American child, or a Latino child, or a gay and lesbian child, or a handicapped child, or a child with disability, if I've never experienced those type of communities? If I've never been uh, humbled myself and got down and went to Richmond, go to Oakland, go to Contra Costa, go to Sacramento, go to San Francisco, go to Hunters Point, go to the Tenderloin, go to, go to different areas and just have dinner, enjoy the community, and just get a feel of what's happening. And then when I stand up as a lawyer and I see a family come in the courtroom and a kid is charged with a simple theft and they have to deal with a certain limit, and very the limit in California is $950 now. If you, if you steal something over $950, the DA has discretion to charge you with a felony. That's on the, the book right now. So some counties in this, in this state, if it's nine hundred and fifty-five dollars is a felony, some counties a thousand dollars is a felony. If I see the alleged amount is, is around that range, and I see a young child who made a mistake and got with the wrong people, the wrong kids after school, and he just was in the wrong place and had a bad attitude towards whatever, and he stole. But once I see the parents. And I see the school counselor and someone standing in the background supporting this child. I, as a prosecutor, think about my power of discretion to consider changing that charge from a felony, felony to a misdemeanor or consider diversion or consider community service. Not the defense attorney makes those decisions, the prosecutor makes those decisions. Not that the judge don't make those decisions unless the DA yields it. Unless the law has a gray area where the judge has discretion to say, yeah, DA, you charge a felony, and I, as a judge, under this law, I see a gray area, I'm going to overrule your charging. But the DA has discretion to charge it. That's in the statute, in the statute of California. So let's think about the, the importance of women in social justice reform from the prosecutor leadership uh, platform these days. For the first time in the history of the California District Attorney Associations, women comprise the influence. The Honorable Daniel Beck, did you hear yet? She is one of my true soldiers of justice, one of my leaders, one of my mentors from Contra Costa County. But uh, I just finished serving on the California District Attorney Board of Directors for the whole state of California. I am not an elected official, but I have served as a representative of the, of the trial attorneys, the deputy DA. So I had the opportunity for two years to sit as an executive board member in the conference room with elected DAs from all over the state. How powerful of an opportunity.
opportunity was that for me. And they welcomed me. And they welcomed the passion in which I talked to them about what they need to be doing in the state to take the lead on social justice, take the lead on prosecutorial leadership, prosecution prevention, and protection. Don't wait till the masses come to you and say the DA messed up, or there was a wrong charge, or there was some problems. We need to take the lead, take the lead, and be the voice of the people who we stand up and say, oh, this group's for the people. If I'm, to, if I'm standing up in court and saying, oh, this group's for the people, you better believe I'm representing the people. And if I'm representing, educating, having passion for service above self, I want to get out and make sure I can be the first one to make, take corrective actions, to, to, to correct things if, if the public thinks there's some wrong in some legislature and we got to enforce it, enforce the law in the courts, then we should take that first action to make sure the public know we're doing the right thing. Did you agree? Yes. yes. So, uh, 25, maybe 25 of the 58 lawyers, I think it's 24 of the 58 lawyers in the state of California are women now. That only happened, ladies and gentlemen, probably within the last 12 years. The majority of the prosecution leadership for many years in this state have been all white men. So you can't blame the women. <laughs> Am I right? Yes. You can't blame the African Americans or the Latinos. You can't blame. And there's never been an African American male elected to uh, a district attorney office in the history of California. And mind you, Kamala Harris was the first black female elected as a district attorney in the state of California and the first woman elected as attorney general. Uh, Nancy O'Malley was the first woman elected as DA in Alameda County. Uh, Jackie Lacey was the first woman elected to LA County DA's office and the first African-American woman. Uh, Diana Beckton was the first African-American woman elected to Contra Costa DA's office. So you, you have to give tribute and homage of the power and influence of women. So now, what, what I'm getting to is how are women? Now you're about to see some social justice influence and change and, and corrective actions taken in some of the prosecutor ranks because women are about to be majority of the prosecution leadership in the state. I can see that happen. They almost, they almost have, but they're moving towards being the leadership and from my experience, being from Social Mississippi, you have my bio. The first social justice vanguard drum major that I experienced, I knew in my life was my mother. She raised six children by herself. And I'm the grandson of a sharecropper. And you can think how is an African-American man from Social Mississippi, real rural South, end up in marvelous Moran County. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen, ladies and gentlemen, because statistically, one out of every three black males born in the United States, they've already did the statistics. They said, you will be dead before you're 25, you're going to be on drugs or in prison. Well, when I mentor kids, like the kids I mentioned that were mentored in Contra Costa County for, for four, three, four years, still mentor them, I told them, you are not a part of those statistics. Those statistics were not written by your family. Those statistics were written by someone else who had another agenda. So don't read those statistics and let those statistics become a part of your conversation. So what is social justice? Uh, is, it, it, what is it to you? I mean, we know it, it can deal with the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. We know that it, 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 it impacts its equality, freedom, common good. Admittedly, it has lost its meaning as it's become more of a buzzword for activists and more of a buzzword for campaigners and more of a buzzword for politicians. Ladies and gentlemen, I say that's true. It's easy to think of what is not social justice. And I want you to think of what is not social justice. 
uh, is not gender, is not equality. Social justice is not equality. Social justice is equality, not in inequality. Uh, social justice is not government censorship. Uh, social justice is not racism. Social justice is not homophobia. Uh, what, the, what the characteristics of social justice, when we look at it, you and I, we are thinking of racism. We're thinking of how we change this whole idea of racism in our counties, in our communities, uh, ageism, sexism, uh, religion, uh, we'll make sure uh, uh, sexuality, all those things, uh, human trafficking, all those issues come into mind when we think about social justice, we think about the cause of the human being trying to do the human good to change the human behavior that are caused by conducts of humans who did the wrong. Am I right? So um, we talk about equity, access, participation, um, human rights, civil rights, environmental rights, all those are in the general realm of social justice. How can you fight to social justice? I read somewhere, and it, it talked about educate yourself. Uh, social injustice, I'm, I'm excuse me, educate yourself, engagement, social engagement, get involved, get the experience. If you say, I am my brother's keeper, I'm about to take you to my, 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 my mother talking to me about the Bible and, and, and Genesis and Cain and Abel, you know. <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of things, ladies and gentlemen, from the mother of it, uh, from a mother who didn't finish high school. She taught me about that. Uh, I, I am my brother's keeper. What did that mean to you, son? The clarity stated, I am my brother's keeper, or am I my, my brother's keeper? I say this, you are responsible to be your brother's keeper. You are responsible to be your sister's keeper. You are responsible to be the person next to your keeper. You are responsible to be your community's keeper. You are responsible to look out for everybody in your community and stand up for those people who are disenfranchised and been treated wrong. You are responsible. To, that's what it means. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. I am my a community keeper. What happens to you, what happens to her, affects all of you. What happens to the black women in your community affects all the white women in the community. What happens to the gay and lesbian women in the community affects all the other women in the community. And so if you don't say you are your sister's keeper, think of that, what that really means to you. Ask yourself, you know, look to the person to the left and look in front of you and behind you and ask yourself, are you really your sister's keeper? Have you really thought about that? Do you have your sister's back? Are you really committed to social justice and reform? I say you are. I can see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> uh, the fight injustice. Work on your own habits and beliefs. Research the local presence. You know, uh, talk to in the nine counties of the Bay Area. The nine county. I saw the Honorable Dinah Becker, who's my mentor. That she she knows it. I always tell her that. But uh, of the nine counties in the Bay Area, six of them are led by women. And some of you probably haven't reflected on that. That's power and influence. That's important for you to be even more empowered. I got two minutes to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> so she told me I had 10 minutes. So I want to share this last point, point to you. I read an article in November. And it was from a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor. He attacked this whole ideal of social justice in America. He's, his article was in the Washington Post. He wrote an opinion, he was a federal prosecutor, and he said, all the people who talk about social justice, activists, and campaigners got it wrong. The only role of a prosecutor is to enforce the rule of the law and follow the letter of the law. We should not be uh, uh, exercising discretion to the extreme. We should not be concerned about mental health. We should not be concerned about restorative justice practice. We should not be concerned about diversion and community service. I say to that gentleman, and I'm not going to mention his name, you can look up the Washington Post and an opinion. It's a very skewed opinion. And I can tell 
for reading that, but that person never had any life experience. That person didn't understand what it means to take that oath to be a prosecutor. Service above self, serving the people, standing for what's right, standing for the disenfranchised, representing everybody in the courtroom, representing the defendants, due process, right? Because he has a lawyer, but the prosecutor is responsible for making sure all the rights in the courtrooms flow equitably. And all the, and the, and all the prosecutor and the attorney in the courtroom checks the judge sometime. Okay? Because the last word in a criminal case is, what is the prosecutor going to do? In a, in a criminal trial, nothing happens until the DA shows up. Because the, the defendant has a right not to testify. So the prosecutor has to prove the case. But the prosecutor first has to do justice and seek justice and look around the courtroom and say, uh, wait a minute. I don't think we should go to trial here. I'm going to do the right thing and influence this case the right way. And most times when that happens, we achieve justice and social justice in the court. And that happens when you have prosecutors with passion, pro prosecutors who have a conscience, prosecutors who have a heart, prosecutors who have had experience, life experience, understand their community, and care about everybody. So I'm asking you to uh, stay active, stay involved, stay engaged, and congratulations 100 years.